Hello and welcome to this online service from Newcastle Presbyterian Church. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says this, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. God is the author and creator of life. Uh, human beings were made to flourish in relationship to him, uh, an eternal relationship. The human tragedy is that we have all turned away from God and yet God in his grace has pursued us in his son and offers us eternal life, the life for which we were made, if we trust in him and look to him. And so we take this time today to look to our God, to hear his word, the words of eternal life, and to respond in, in praise and thanks and in trust and in obedience. We're going to begin with a hymn that, that says, Come, O fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing your grace. The words will appear on the screen. Uh, why not join in at home? Seal it, seal it for thy 
Let's pray to our God, the author of life. Our Heavenly Father, you are the author of life. You are the God of grace and everlasting love. We praise you for your character. And we praise you for the story and truth of your love and kindness. How the Lord Jesus left the realms of glory, made himself nothing, and took on human nature, how he came to serve and give himself in death on the cross. Our God, if, if we are no, those who know that we were strangers from you, indeed estranged from you, and how you sought and rescued us, then if, if we are those who know that, then our hearts want to sing of your grace with songs of loudest praise. Lord, we confess how quick we are to forget what you've done for us, we take for granted all that you've given to us, our lives, our breath, our, our talents, the skills we possess. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for using these for our own glory rather than yours. Forgive us for our lack of wonder and gratitude. Oh Lord, please renew our hearts. Cleanse them and purify them by your Holy Spirit. Help us to live according to your perfect will, knowing that it is the pathway of freedom hope and joy. Please, by your Spirit, daily tune our hearts to sing of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm now going to hand over to Lewis, who's got a message for young and old alike. Well, that was pretty cool. Um, hello, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Um, I was just thinking, and then obviously suddenly I ended up here, but I was just thinking, I'm feeling quite hungry today and I'd love a snack. Do you know what would be lovely? A bag of crisps. I wonder what your favourite bag of crisps is, what um, brand or what flavour? What flavour do I like? I like ready salted and I love walkers. It'd be lovely if I had a bag of walkers ready salted. Imagine they just appeared. Um, I'm learning some new skills today, aren't I? So, I mean, here I have a bag of ready salted walkers. Amazing. Um, the only problem is, I don't have enough for me and for all of you to have some as well. Um, I probably will still eat them, but that actually reminds me of a Bible story and a story that we're going to look at today. Um, and you can find this in John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. So if you're going to follow along or you'd like to check it out later, you can find this in the New Testament in John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. Um, but first, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the kitchen and we're going to talk about the story. So let's go. Ooh. So here we are in the kitchen of the church. I want to tell you about a wonderful miracle that Jesus did. So Jesus and his disciples were very tired and they needed some time to relax. They'd been busy going around different places, talking to people, sharing God's love with people and helping them. So they got into a boat and they went away to a quiet place to spend some time to rest. When they reached their destination, um, there were actually people there waiting for Jesus. The people had heard all about Jesus, all about what he had been doing and saying, and they were so excited about what he had to say, that they forgot to eat. They forgot about eating. Uh, it was getting late and everyone was getting hungry. So the disciples went to Jesus and they said, it's getting late, we're hungry, send the people away so that we can go and get something to eat. Jesus answered them, you don't need to send, away, send them away. We don't need to make them go away. Feed them. So a young boy who was in the crowd at the time came forward and he was willing to offer his food. So he brought along his basket and in his basket he had five loaves of bread. So five loaves of bread and two fish. Okay, so five loaves of bread and two fish. And he was one thing to share this with the people that were there. There was a problem though. There were 5,000 people there, or possibly more, 5,000 people, and he wanted to share his five loaves of bread and his two fish. Do you think that would have been enough? Of course not. They wouldn't have had enough to feed everyone. So the disciples said, feed them. 
How can we feed them? We only have five loaves of bread and two small fish. That is all the food that we have in the basket. So Jesus told the disciples, bring me the basket. Bring me the loaves and the fish and to tell everyone to sit on the grass. So the disciples did exactly that. They brought Jesus the basket and they told everyone to sit down. Jesus took the five loaves of bread and the two fish and he looked up to heaven and he gave thanks. This is when things got pretty exciting. I'll show you what happened. The food that they had multiplied. So if we take a little bit of time here to look at our loaves, count with me. We started off with five loaves. We now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have ten loaves of bread. And how many fish did we start off with? We had two fish and now we have one, two, three, four fish. That's pretty cool, isn't it? He then gave the food to the disciples and they shared it out among the people. If I were to share my snack of my crisps with you today, there wouldn't be enough for you even to get a tiny crumb. But when Jesus blessed the loaves and the fish, the Bible says that everyone ate until they were full. But wait, that's not all. The Bible doesn't tell us how, exactly how many fish and how many loaves we ended up with. We used um, four, and we ended up with four fish here and ten loaves as an example. Um, but we know that the food multiplied. But we also know that there was so much food left over that after they had eaten until they were full, they were able to gather up leftovers and there were still 12 baskets full of food. Isn't that incredible? 12 baskets full of food left over. Now by the power of video editing I was able to multiply um, the loaves and the fish and I was able to transport myself from the upstairs room and down into the kitchen. Unfortunately I can't do all that normally without a computer but Jesus can. Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fish Jesus was doing miracles all the time. Uh, miracles that were very real and weren't edited. <laughs> um, and these miracles, especially feeding the 5,000, showed, pe showed the people there and also shows us that Jesus has the power of God. Jesus has amazing power. And it also shows us that Jesus can provide for our every need. Not because he can or because he wants to show off, but because he wants to, uh, because he loves us so, so much. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this story. We thank you that um, Jesus was able to show his power, uh, to show the people that he cared for them and he loved them, and to, to use these miracles to speak to people. Um, so I just thank you for this. I also thank you for the little boy who shared his food um, and just for the story that this tells, um, for the care and the generosity and for the love. Um, so yeah, we just thank you for this and we pray that as we go into this week that you will be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well now, for those who are part of the church family here at Newcastle Presbyterian Church, there are just a few items of church news that I'd like to go through at this point. Uh, the usual announcements to say, do look out for the, the link to our Zoom hangout time. Uh, every Sunday we hang out over Zoom from 10.45 till 11 o'clock. Uh, the link we always put up on our Facebook page, look out for that and do join with us. It's a great little time for those who, who do join us each week. Then also look out for the weekly prayer resources from our denomination, Let's Pray. Uh, again, we put the link to that up every week on our Facebook page. Also, you'll be aware that in uh, the last month or so, we held a survey among the congregation. Big thank you to all who responded to that. I think we had about 146 responses in the end. Uh, again, we've put a little video highlighting the main uh, responses and results of that survey on our Facebook page. So if you go to our Facebook page, scroll down it, you'll find uh, all the sort of feedback on results from that survey. So do, do take a look. By the way, uh, I did say this early in these online services, but maybe it's worth just saying by way of reminder, you do not need to have your own Facebook account in order to see our Facebook page. 
Uh, if you uh, Google Newcastle Presbyterian Church Facebook, you should be able to find our Facebook page and everything that we have there is, is open for all the world to see. So you can take a look even if you're not on, on Facebook. Now, it was a real joy last Sunday to be able to uh, open our doors uh, for our first physical gathering uh, for corporate worship after a gap of some six months. A big thank you to all who came along to that. Uh, overwhelmingly, we have heard positive comments about how encouraging it was uh, and how safely and appropriately everything uh, was conducted. So a big thank you to all those who set up and stewarded and cleaned uh, as well. Uh, I want to invite you all to plan to come along in the coming weeks. Uh, I hope you have got the message that in order to attend, you do need to book. Due to social distancing, our building at the moment can only accommodate about 70 people. Um, if you haven't booked for this evening, uh, then I'm afraid at this point it's too late. But this is the system uh, for the coming weeks. We're going to be running Sunday evening gatherings from now until the 25th of October. Uh, and then we plan, God willing, to switch to Sunday morning gatherings from the 1st of November. If you want to come along on any given week or every week, uh, then you will have to book. Uh, book online using Eventbrite. Uh, we'll be making sure that a link to Eventbrite is on our Facebook page. If you can't use the online booking system, then you can uh, phone the, the church office uh, from 9.30 to 1.30 on Tuesdays uh, and between 9.30 and 4.30 on Thursdays. We'll be putting uh, several Sundays up onto Eventbrite uh, at a time, so if you don't manage to book in uh, for next Sunday, do try uh, for one of the following Sundays. Uh, please do bear with us as we try to establish a pattern uh, that will work uh, going forward. Now, uh, we've put together a, a little video to explain what you might expect uh, when you do come along to one of our gatherings. And so although we've shown it for the last couple of weeks, we're going to show it again now, just so everybody knows how things will work. So let's take a look at that video now. Hello everyone, we're really looking forward to being able to welcome people back into our buildings as we're able to reopen and gather again. The purpose of this video is to walk you through the building and to talk you through what to expect when you do come along to one of our gatherings. Of course, our priority is safety, particularly with respect to the restrictions around COVID-19. Obviously, if you do have any of the symptoms of COVID-19, a high temperature, a new continuous cough, or a loss or change to your sense of smell or taste, if you should be self-isolating, or if you have been in close contact with a confirmed case, then you should not attend. Also, uh, do exercise wisdom if you think you might be vulnerable because of age or other health conditions. Now, because of social distancing, we are limited in terms of the numbers that we can accommodate in the building. Uh, and so to come along, you will need to book in advance, either online or by contacting the church office. We will post the details of how you can do so on our Facebook page. On the day of the gathering, please do plan to arrive early, from 15 minutes or so before the service time, so we can get people seated as efficiently as possible. We have had to put a one-way system in place at the church, so you will enter from the back door here on Valencia Place. Should you have to wait outside, please do maintain social distancing. Also, unless you have a medical reason not to, then you should wear a face mask or covering in line with the church leaders and government's guidance. On entry through the door, you will be greeted by a steward. Please refrain from handshakes, hugs or physical contact throughout the time in the building. There will be a hand sanitising station on entry. Please do make use of it. Proceed down through the corridor and welcome area in the direction marked out on the floor. There will also be floor markings to help you maintain social distancing throughout the building. Also, please do not wander off into other parts of the building. The upstairs, for example, remains closed at this time. As you pass through the welcome area, there will be a basket in which to drop your offering. Although we would encourage, if possible, uh, to give by online means or through standing order. When you reach the glass door, please wait here for a steward who will direct you to where to sit.
you'll find the main auditorium looks a bit different. Some pews are blocked off to maintain social distancing, and the stewards will also be directing you to follow a one-way system. Please understand you may have a favourite seat in normal times, but at the moment you cannot sit just anywhere of your choosing. You must sit where you are directed to sit by a steward. Once you're in your seat, please remain here for the duration of the service. We'd love to see families coming along, kids included, but please be mindful that you will have to stay together in the seating assigned to you throughout the service. All the books have been removed from the pews to facilitate cleaning. You might want to bring along your own Bible so that you can follow along in the service. In the event of a fire or other emergency, there will be stewards on the doors and they will direct you what to do. We would encourage you to use toileting facilities at home before arriving at church. Although the toilets in the welcome area will be available, it would be helpful if we could minimise their use as much as possible. The service will last about 45 minutes. At the end, please remain in your seats until you are directed to leave by a steward. Everyone will exit the building through the side door beside the pulpit, straight out onto the street. Unfortunately, people cannot remain around in the building to converse. We hope that you might find appropriate and restriction compliant ways of speaking to others once outside the building. Well everyone, I hope this walkthrough has been helpful. Uh, please do bear with us in the weeks ahead as we learn uh, from our early experiences and see how this goes and think about what will serve the welfare of all people uh, as we go forward. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 uh, says, uh, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Uh, I do hope that those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus will make a priority of gathering together uh, as Christian believers in this place once again. We do look forward to welcoming you in the Sundays ahead. Well, if you are coming along this evening, just a, a little reminder to say, enter by the rear door uh, and remember a, a face covering. Friends, last week underlined for me the significance of the physical gathering. Uh, even if we weren't able to get up close to, to each other and, and speak, uh, simply sharing the same space and being together was a real blessing. It underlined for, for me as a preacher how preaching is an interaction between real human beings where preacher and congregation can look each other in the eyes and respond to one another. Uh, that does not happen on a screen over the internet. Unreservedly, I say, if you don't come along, you are missing out. Obviously, there are some good reasons why uh, some maybe can't make it along at the moment. Uh, you know, if you do have the symptoms of COVID, if you've been told to self-isolate, or if you're vulnerable for some other reasons. Uh, obviously, uh, you shouldn't come along in those circumstances. But for everyone else who is able to get out and about, please do plan to come along. Uh, if you've been out and about in town, I can assure you that coming to church is about as low a risk activity as you could undertake. Christian people are called by God to gather together. Uh, we do look forward to welcoming you in the weeks ahead. These are all the announcements. I'm now going to hand over to Jamie and to Cheryl to lead us in praise. Psalm 118 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And then verse 21 it says, I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, join with us now as we sing Cornerstone. Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame 
but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak, made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. In Christ alone, cornerstone, weak, made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Thank you to Lois for earlier and to Jamie and Cheryl for leading us there. Friends, we're going to turn to the Bible now. Uh, and this week, we're going to turn to John chapter 6. This week and for the next few Sundays, we're going to do a little mini-series uh, in this chapter from God's Word uh, and from the Gospel of John. So if you've got a Bible there at home, uh, please do take a look with me as we look today at John chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. This is John chapter 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had been performing on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked us only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. 
Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. This is God's word. If you do have that open in front of you at home, please do keep it open. You might find it helpful in the minutes ahead. Let's pray for the Lord's help that we would understand his word as we look at it together. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the words of Jesus, we find the words of eternal life. So help us listen to him. Help us receive these words as what they are, your gracious words. May we hear your words of grace coming to us today. And may we respond in faith in your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Have you ever asked for directions and got told, just keep following the signs and you can't go wrong? And, and maybe you, you set out and you followed the first couple of signs and then you thought to yourself, oh, I'll take a little shortcut here instead. And before long, you were lost. Ever been in, in a position something like that? Sometimes we fail to follow a crucial sign where it is pointing. And the result is that we end up far from where we're meant to be. The Apostle John wants to signpost us to Jesus. He wants us to see who Jesus really is, to see that we need him, miss Jesus, and we miss what we need most. The sad thing is that so many miss the signposts to who Jesus is, or they have such a preconceived idea fixed in their minds that they've never thought to investigate the real Jesus. It's not a new problem. It was the same in Jesus's time. Indeed, many saw the signs and still got it all wrong. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna look at John 6 as John signposts us to and shows us the real Jesus. Now, can I invite us all to look at where the signposts are pointing? It may be that the real Jesus it is different to the idea that you have in your head. It would be a tragedy to miss out on the truth. I want to highlight two signposts today. Signpost one, King Jesus gives life. King Jesus gives life, verses one to 15. What we have here is one of the most famous events in Jesus's earthly ministry, the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only miracle other than the resurrection that is recorded in all four Gospels. It was probably the most public of Jesus's miracles in terms of the sheer number of people who, who, who saw it. Clearly, it left a, an impression. Uh, let's think about how the events unfolded. Uh, Jesus is up in Galilee. He's gone up a mountainside on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee with his disciples but they hardly get time to draw breath before they see that a crowd is coming their way. Verse two, a great crowd of people followed Jesus because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. 
John's recorded a number of Jesus' miracles by now, so it's no wonder that Jesus is causing a stir. A great crowd is coming their way. And immediately Jesus sees a very practical problem. There's no burger van out in that area, and so he, he wonders, where are the people going to get food? He turns to Philip and, uh, in verse 5 and asks, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Well, Jesus already knew what he was intending to do. His question was a test for Philip. Would the disciples, who by this time had seen Jesus turn gallons and gallons of water into wine, realise that he would have no problem supplying the needs of these people? I'm afraid Philip doesn't quite pass the test, and instead the assessment of Philip and Andrew conveys how overwhelming the need is and the fact that there is no human solution to it. Philip tells Jesus, look Jesus, if, if I were to, to go back to my job and if I were to work flat out in eight months' time, I still wouldn't have put together enough cash to get everyone here a pasty supper each. Andrew's done his best, but even he realises that his suggestion is a bit pathetic. He's found a, a young lad with a packed lunch of five barley loaves and two uh, little fish. That would have been a, a poor man's lunch in those days. Certainly not enough to feed this crowd. However, no matter how great the need, it is no problem to Jesus. He, he has the people sit down, he gives thanks for the food, and he begins to hand it out. The extraordinary thing is that the more he broke up the bread, the more there was to break. He just kept going and going and going. Jesus here is the host of this meal, and what a generous host he is. We, we can see that when we appreciate that the scale of what's going on here. Uh, how many people were there? Well, verse 10 tells us that there were 5,000 men. Uh, Matthew tells us that there were women and children as well. In other words, the head count is probably of the husbands and fathers. The total crowd, therefore, could have been as many as 20,000 people. It is a vast crowd. It is the capacity crowd of Ravenhill, the Kingspan Stadium. John highlights in verse 11 how each person received as much as they wanted. No one went hungry. Verse 12, they all had enough to eat. Do you see that when Jesus is the host to feed the people, there is more than enough. There, there are leftovers, verse 13, 12 baskets worth. This is the ultimate free lunch. What a generous host Jesus is. Bear in mind, in, in those days, people really had to scrape together enough each day to eat that day. It was uh, subsistence living of, of a kind that I don't imagine any of us uh, have had to face or experience. It was a daily slog simply to eat. A huge spread like this on that mountainside that day must have been astounding. You would have been staggered if you'd been there, glad and grateful to have been there. Uh, occasionally, uh, you hear today of, of, of competitions where there's a, a prize that might consist of something like a year's supply of groceries or something like that. Uh, and you might think to yourself, well, gosh, wouldn't it be great to have uh, that kind of material provision sorted for you? So if someone came along who was able to provide in the way that Jesus does on that mountainside that day, I'd have thought you'd want to stick pretty close to this guy. Uh, the crowd there clearly recognised Jesus as special and some whispers start to go around the crowd. I tell you what, let's have this guy as our king. Yes, let's make him our king. Well, that's the event. But there's more going on here. And John flags it up for us. Uh, this was a spectacular event in and of itself, that's for sure, but it happens at a very significant time of year. Verse 4, the Jewish Passover feast was near. The Passover was a massive deal. I suppose it would maybe be something akin to Independence Day in the USA, only an even bigger deal than that. It, it, for the Jewish people, the Passover was the rescue event of your nation's history. God had freed you from slavery in Egypt and brought you into the promised land. 
How had God done this? Well, every year the festival recalled how God's mighty judgment on Egypt had bought their freedom. Every firstborn son in Egypt was going to die, but in every Israelite home, a lamb had died in the place of the firstborn son. And as the events of that first Passover had unfolded, God's action caused the Pharaoh to let God's people go. Of course, the the people back then had been led by Moses, the prophet that God had raised up. As they left Egypt, they, they escaped the pursuit of Pharaoh through the waters of the Red Sea. They found themselves in the wilderness and very quickly out of food. And just as quickly, they started to grumble. What was going to happen? Where are they going to get the food? Exodus 16 verse 4 gives the answer. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And out there in the wilderness, God provided all that they needed. It was a miraculous provision of bread that they came to call manna. Well, of course, that was the time of the Exodus. That was history. And yet, as the annual Passover came around, there was also an air of expectation. You see, in Deuteronomy 18, God had promised that another prophet would come along, a Moses-like prophet, Moses said in in Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. And so the Passover was a festival filled with nationalistic excitement and expectations of a new rescuer, a new Moses-like prophet. If you were a Jew living under Roman occupation, wouldn't you want another prophet like Moses, another prophet to bring freedom The prophet Isaiah had looked forward to the disgrace of God's people being removed. He said of that day in Isaiah 25, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples. Well, as the people sat on a mountainside in Galilee that day, being given their fill of food, they start to wonder, is this our guy? Look at verse 14. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And in a sense, they're they're right, or they're nearly right. They're right in what they say, but wrong in their understanding. They they have seen the signpost. They're right that, that Jesus is the prophet but they're completely wrong about the sort of prophet Jesus is. They've got an agenda that they they want Jesus to fit. It's a political agenda. It involves earthly power. Let's build the kingdom of God in a nation state here and now, Jesus. It's an image that some in our day may be quite like, isn't it? Jesus, the kind of political activist, a kind of ancient Che Guevara figure. Some Christians over the centuries have tragically taken wrong turns in trying to advance the cause of Christ by force. It's not Jesus' way. Jesus is, is not interested. That's not what he's about. Do you look at verse 15? Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. You might remember how later in his trial before Pilate, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is from another place. You see, Jesus' ambitions are not narrowly political. He has a grander vision. He has come to deal with a deeper problem. He has come to deal with the most pressing matter of all. I don't completely want to steal my own thunder from next week, but if you glance down to verses 33 and 35, you'll see how Jesus explains his mission. He says, verse 33, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. You want to find ultimate satisfaction? All the political power, status and wealth in the world will not provide it. We were made for God 
And only in Jesus do we find the freedom of eternal life, the relationship with God for which we were made. King Jesus gives life. That is the signpost of this event. This event points us to Jesus as the true rescuer, the true prophet, the true Passover lamb who dies in our place. He is the king, yes. He is the king who gives life abundantly. And that should be a surprise to us. Uh, earthly rulers tend to use their power for their own ends and own enrichment. But do you see that Jesus is the king who gives? Is that the picture of Jesus that you have grasped? King Jesus gives life. He provides abundant life. Don't withhold yourself from him. If you do, you're the one who is missing out. Signpost two today is this, King Jesus is God. Signpost two, King Jesus is God, verses 16 to 21. Well, we've already seen that Jesus is a different sort of king from the type of king the people expected. Uh, that has been seen publicly by the crowd. Now it is underlined privately to Jesus' disciples. Jesus is no mere man to be squeezed into human agendas. Uh, Jesus has slipped off by himself. Uh, the evening comes and the disciples decide to set out across the lake for Capernaum. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is about 600 feet below sea level uh, and is prone to furious storms blowing up. Uh, and such a storm kicks off that night. It makes the, the, the journey very hard going. Uh, the lake is, is about six miles across, so they're only just a bit over halfway over when they see a most bizarre sight. A figure is approaching them, walking on the water uh, as you or I would, would stroll down the street. If you look at the end of verse 19, you'll see it says, they were terrified. Well, you would be, wouldn't you? Jesus calls to them, telling them, them that it's him. What kind of man walks on turbulent waters? Well, the man who is God. What is impossible for a mere man is perfectly possible for the one who made the sea. This is a, a moment of, of epiphany, a, a, if you like, a revelation of God. Job comments of God. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 had already displayed Jesus' creative power. He is the one who makes abundance out of nothing. And in verse 20, when Jesus says, it is I, don't be afraid, what he literally says in the Greek is, I am, don't be afraid. He takes the name of God onto his lips, for God had revealed his name to Moses as, I am that I am. What the disciples glimpse on the lake that night is that they are in the presence of not just a human king, but the divine king. God's king, come to give life to the world. That's the signpost of this event. King Jesus is God. The disciples take Jesus on board. Uh, look at verse 21. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Now, it's not entirely clear if this is a, a further miracle, a kind of instantaneous arrival at their destination, uh, but Certainly the other Gospels relate how at least the storm died down. With Jesus on board, they reach their destination with ease. And do you notice again the echo of Exodus? Remember how God rescued through the waters of the Red Sea. Isaiah says of God, he made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. And here, if you like, is a, is a rescue miracle by Jesus through the stormy waters of that sea that night. In Jesus, we see God himself, the commander of the seas, who brings hope and rescue to his people. John wrote at the start of his gospel, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. In this event, the disciples saw something of that fact, that Jesus is not a king like any other, King Jesus is God. Friends, we need 
a rescuer, a king, a hero. We need a hero, not just big enough to give us hope in life's storms, but a hero big enough to conquer death and restore us to eternal life. Life with God, the life for which we were made, life in all its fullness. And this story points us to Jesus as the true king we need. I wonder, do you see that? These events, the the, the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on water, provide the, the backdrop for what we're going to hear Jesus going on to say in this chapter. Who is it that can say, I am the bread of life? Well, it seems to me that John records these events events to point us to who Jesus really is. I wonder, does it challenge our view of him today? Do we see where the signposts are pointing? If we want to know ultimate satisfaction, if we are to receive eternal life, then we need to come to the one who came to give life in all abundance. We need to come to the one who is God himself. He is the one greater than Moses who comes to rescue. Friends, missing a signpost can be disastrous. I hope we'll not miss this. May we all look to Jesus to receive life in his name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you that in him we receive grace upon grace that he is the one who gives fullness of life eternal. Thank you that he is king, a gracious king, and he is God. May we see him and acknowledge him this day, and may we know and receive the life he gives. Gracious God, we continue to remember those who are especially vulnerable at this time. We pray for care homes, those known to us, including River House here in Newcastle. Lord, please sustain the staff in their caring role. Please be near to all the residents and in days where contact with family is limited, please lift them up and may they know the comfort of your love. In your mercy, Lord, please spare these homes from the pandemic. Lord, may residents and staff alike look to Jesus and be found in him. Eternal God, we remember our partners in Open Doors today who ask us to pray for Qatar, a country where Christians are increasingly persecuted. We use these words from open doors. Lord Jesus, thank you that you reign over the nations, including Qatar. May the light of your gospel break through the oppression there and shine on and through our brothers and sisters. Please protect those who must keep their faith secret and strengthen Christians who are working to prepare for the 2022 World Cup. May they find their joy and peace in you. Lord, please open opportunities for the gospel to be shared in Qatar. We conclude these prayers using this prayer adapted from recent Let's Pray resources. This is a prayer to hasten slowly in a world of hurry. Lord of time, all of a sudden everything has speeded up again after the Maybe slower pace of lockdown, hurry sickness has set in once more. We feel it in ourselves, we sense it all around in society. We know it in the way local churches have approached the resumption of their life, the re-emergence of that ever-present push to more and faster. Patient Lord, creator of a world in six days, gradually developing each aspect of life when you could have done it with one word. Redeemer of humanity who waits for the fullness of time to come before sending your Saviour. Builder of a kingdom that grows at the pace of nature from seed to sapling to tree, from leaven to loaf. Help us to hasten slowly in these days. Rather than rush to what was before or hurry headlong into the new future, please grant us the grace of waiting, of walking, not running, little by little, moment by moment, day by day, letting you set our pace, keeping in step with the Spirit's leading. Please reveal your will and wisdom to our hearts that our daily lifestyles, priorities and service might be shaped accordingly. Train us in timeliness, rein in our impulsiveness, make us mature and discerning, not premature and deciding 
that we might better sense your presence and prompting, your leading and guiding. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Well, when we see God's creative power and his power to rescue and save in Jesus, then it should move us to praise. We're going to do that as we sing now to our Lord, How Great Thou Art. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, please do look out again this time next week and also do look out for the booking system and book yourself in for one of the, the coming Sundays or indeed all the coming Sundays. We look forward to seeing you back in our building in, in our times together. Let's close our time together today now in prayer. Let us pray. 
May the companionship of the man of sorrows and the power of the King of glory remain with you and all your days. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us always. Amen.